Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming down as we get settled in. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity here today uh, to learn from a, a person who has created so much history. And, uh, I think we are extremely uh, fortunate to have the presentation we have coming up. So to get us started, I want to make sure that we are the most respectful students we can be for our guests here. So if everybody can do me a favor, pull out your phone, turn it off, and put it back in your pocket for the rest of the time. That'd be very grateful. We, uh, you will have an opportunity at the end if you would like to take pictures and share any of your learning here today through any social media accounts. You'd be welcome to do that at the end. Um, but for the presentation, we want to make sure we're being respectful. So please put your phone away, turn it off so you don't get distracted uh, because we have an enormous opportunity here. So to get us started, I want to introduce, uh, who most people know, Mr. Allison, to do the introduction. So here's Mr. Allison. Okay, first of all, Colin, you want to stand up over there? We have uh, Colin Hansen is from uh, the Edgar School District and he puts up. Yeah, let's give him a hand. We, uh, he's, a, he's a rock star over there in Edgar and he has been bringing speakers in, oh, I don't know, for the last decade. Uh, his program is called Walk in Their Shoes and uh, today, we have, as you can see, Joan Trumpower Mulholland today, and I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about her. Joan is a recipient of the 2015 National Civil Rights Museum Freedom Award. You can, you can actually see her in the background there in a statue that's, that's in Washington, D.C. in the museum. And uh, she's also a 2018 I Am A Man Award. Uh, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Annual Award of Honor and the Anti-Defamation League Annual Heroes Against Hate Award. Now her Freedom Rider mugshot, which you're gonna see here soon, has been called one of the most iconic pictures in American history. And by the time she was 23 years old, Joan had participated in over 50 sit-ins and demonstrations, including the famous Freedom Rides that you've all studied. And you know, those pictures of the Greyhounds that were tipped over in Aniston, you're gonna hear about that firsthand today. And you've probably seen pictures of the Woolworths sit-in. She participated in the Jackson Woolworths sit-ins, and that's another iconic photo that, that we have all seen in history books. She also participated in the famous March on Washington, had a lot to do with that. Uh, many of you have heard of James Meredith, who was the first black man to integrate uh, one of our schools down south. Uh, I think it was the University of Mississippi, and she was involved in the Meredith uh, March Against Fear. Uh, she also was involved in the very famous Selma March, and we all know about that, the march uh, to gain uh, voting rights for African American people that Dr. King uh, organized. So Selma to Montgomery March. Her path has crossed some of the most, you know, some of the most famous names in the civil rights movement, including Dr. King, Medgar Evers, who uh, led the NAACP uh, down there in Mississippi, and Fannie Lou Hammer, John Lewis, and you all know who John Lewis is, Congressman from from Georgia, Diane Nash, famous for her sit-ins, and Julian Bond. Joan has appeared in several books, including Coming of Age in Mississippi, Breach of Peace, We Shall Not Be Moved, and She Stood for Freedom. She's appeared on television and news programs like the CBS Nightly News and award-winning win documentaries, which includes An Ordinary Hero, which I think many of you have seen. Okay. She was also in the PBS uh, feature length documentary called The Freedom Riders, uh, also standing on my sister's shoulders in the groundbreaking film Eyes on the Prize. And I know you've all seen clips of Eyes on the Prize in your, in your history classroom. With her today is her son, Loki. Loki, you want to wave also from behind there? Now, Loki's pretty famous on his own as an award-winning filmmaker, author, and activist. He's an Emmy-winning producer who has received 40 Telly Awards, 
and Loki's films on race and social justice issues have won 12 Best Documentary Awards. His first book, She Stood for Freedom, was nominated for the 2017 Amelia Bloomer Award. Loki speaks all across the country on issues of race and history, and he's also the founder of the executive and, and executive director of the Joan Chumpower Mulholland Foundation, which was created to end racism through education. So let's please join me and give our guests, Joan Chumpower Mulholland and Loki Mulholland, a warm Wisconsin welcome. She was 19 years old. Um, she'd already been involved in about three dozen sit-ins and protests. And they took that pretty little picture of her and uh, then put her on death row. But um, her story does not start here. And it's, it's very important to, to illustrate that. Um, and she said, you know, I saw something was wrong and decided to do something about it. So she was a 10-year-old girl who saw this injustice and just couldn't let it go. And she said, you know, this is wrong. I'm going to do something about it. She didn't say, this is wrong. Can you take care of it for me? She didn't say, this is wrong. Oh, well, it's just the way things are. She just, again, just couldn't let it go. Uh, several years back, my mother and I, we traveled back to Georgia for a film called The Uncomfortable Truth about the history of institutional racism in America. And we went back to the spot where it all began for her. I'm gonna play that clip for you. So when I was working on this film, we were gonna go back to Georgia, and I asked my mom if she wanted to come along because I knew for the past couple of years that she had been wanting to see some of the old family sites one last time. Things fair, 
I would take that chance. I couldn't have gone into any big philosophical thing on segregation or whatever, but I knew this was wrong and it had to change. And if I hadn't taken that walk, my life would have turned out so much different. So that was one of the best decisions I ever made. Okay, Oconee. It was a logging town, and the houses I knew are no longer there. It was a company town. And there was this dirt road that ran down the middle. And down the middle of the dirt road was a railroad track. Now, I'm going to put a question to y'all. Raise your hand if you know the answer. Teachers, if their kids don't know the answer, you get to, to tell them. The train that came down that track was called the Nancy Hanks. Who in the world was Nancy Hanks? Students? Nobody knows? Teachers? Who was Nancy Hanks? I don't see any hands. Well, I'll tell you. Nancy Hanks was Abraham Lincoln's mama. So you know that train was owned by a Yankee, right? In Oconee, Georgia. It wouldn't be called on a train Nancy Hanks unless some outsider put him up to it. Okay. I was 10 years old when I made the decision at some level, that I was going to do what I could as a Southerner to help make the South the best place that it could be for everybody. And there were a couple little opportunities to do a small thing when I was in high school. But my real chance came when I was a college student in 1960. And I like to say when you Take an action. It's like throwing a pebble in a pond. You don't know how far out those ripples are going to go, where it will all end. In 1960, the sit-in started, and Durham, North Carolina, was the second city to have sit-ins. Now, I was a student at Duke University. My mom wanted me to go there because it was a, you know, a little prestige to it. And I think most importantly, it was a segregated school in the South. So there I was at Duke to you know, keep mama happy. And the students who were doing the sit-ins and picket lines in Durham we were told one night at our Presbyterian youth meeting one Sunday evening that next week there would be some students from North Carolina College come over and explain to us about the demonstrations, keep it sort of quiet, the administration could lock us out of the building, the rowdies could show up and cause trouble, or the police could show up and arrest us all. So it was a somewhat secretive meeting. Well, those students did such a fine job of explaining what they were up to in legal and moral terms. If you can spend your money in this part of the store to get your toiletries and school supplies and socks and things, then your money ought to be good on this side when you wanted to get, you know, a Coke and a, a hot dog. We didn't have McDonald's and all that stuff fast food places in, where you went to the lunch counter. And they couldn't get anything to eat. That was not fair morally and probably not fair legally. And then they invited us Duke students to join them. So a bunch of us did. And that led to me after I got my credit hours finished, you know, my semester at Duke, I split. Well, the North Carolina College students said, well, if you're going up to D.C., go up to Howard and find out what's happened. 
we haven't heard anything from them in a long time. And if they're not doing anything, maybe you can help them get going. Well, I found the students who were in, you know, interested in civil rights. They were having a meeting and they were planning to have a sit-in in a couple of days in Arlington. There we are in Arlington. You see me there looking all, I don't know, beautiful. Um, with the Howard students, Dion and Ethelene. And I'm still good friends with Dion. Ethelene lives in Florida, so I don't see her much. Um, but since I was from Arlington and had been arrested twice, they really, at sit-ins, they really welcomed me to join them in this sit-in in Arlington. So I did, and oh, there we are just a year or so ago, you know. Photoshopping is a great thing, isn't it? And um, we were at um, a nearby eatery, sitting at a counter. We aged a little bit in the, you know, 55 or so years. And um, we kept demonstrating around the Washington, D.C. area. And then the next year, 60, 61, that was the year of the Freedom Rides. Now, the Supreme Court had already ruled that, it, they had ruled actually in the December of 60, the Supreme Court of the United States had said that transportation, public transportation between one state and another, all the facilities had to be open to everybody equally. And the Freedom Rides were to check out if that was being Supreme Court ruling was being obeyed, and when it became evident it wasn't being obeyed, to try to force the Kennedy administration to enforce the Supreme Court ruling. Now let's see a little bit of video about that, um, about the Freedom Rides. This was an idea that caught the imagination of the country. However, the civil rights community thought it was a bit of a, a lark. Um, they thought, oh right, we're, you know, we're just gonna ride our buses through the South you know, for a couple of months. Um, it was almost seen as like a vacation. And some of the people who actually participated initially were viewed as you know, people who were just you know, slackers. They didn't want to do the hard work of going and demonstrating in front of you know, uh, hardcore uh, places, so they were just going to take a bus. I think we knew from the start it could be dangerous. On the other hand, maybe to break the tension, maybe half thinking it. Um, we were teasing Hank and so that, you know, hey, you went off on this all expense paid vacation. Good way to end the semester, buddy. How I spent my summer in 1961, let me tell you the ways. <laughs> they put together a small group of 13 riders, I think it was 13 who left Washington on two separate buses, making their way through the Upper South. In the Upper South, they were attacked a few times, a couple of people were beaten up, arrested, uh, most notably in Rock Hill, South Carolina. But really all hell broke loose when they got to Alabama. And all of a sudden, it made national news and everybody realized this was not just a walk in the park. This was the next stage of the revolution. I had already had a taste seeing the violence. I just barely escaped the Klan. So I had no illusions whatsoever about what was going to happen next. I didn't know anything about Anderson, Alabama. Then we were told that we are literally going into the belly of the beast. Uh, Anderson was a hotbed of Klan activity. And as a matter of fact, uh, Jim Fong, who was uh, pretty good stump speaker, um, spoke that night and told a joke about Anderson in terms of foretelling what we were going to be in for it. He said, there was this bus driver driving a Greyhound bus, and as he got maybe three or four miles from Anderson, he heard this knock, knock, thumping on the side of the bus, so he pulled over to see what it was, and as he opened the door, the Greyhound had gotten down off the side of the bus and wanted to come inside. 
And so he asked, he says, well, why do you want to do that? He said, we get ready to go into Hannister. <laughs> and there are variations of that joke of said one preacher said, Lord, we're getting ready to go down to Alabama and we want you to be with us. And he was silent. And uh, he said, Lord, did you hear me? I want you to be with us. So he heard that voice, I'll go with you as far as Anderson. <laughs> so all kinds of jokes about how dangerous it was going to be. And surely enough, when we got maybe a few miles outside of Anderson, we'd all had been singing on the bus as we did that from time to time. A bus coming from Anderson stopped on the opposite side of the highway and the two bus drivers got out and spoke. And the driver of our bus got back on and looked, kind of looked at us and just kind of smiled. Um, and uh, as we got into Anderson, the streets were deserted. No one. And it was telling us this is not good. A mom firebombed the bus as churchgoers brought their children to watch the Freedom Riders burn alive on Mother's Day. Riders were able to escape, only to be beaten with baseball bats until the local authorities finally stepped in. Freedom Riders were attacked two more times in Birmingham and Montgomery, where it appeared things would come to an end. But a call back to my mother in D.C. to send more riders, and a team led by Diane Nash in Nashville re-energized everyone. However, my mother and the Freedom Riders were now entering Mississippi, a place many would call the Heart of Darkness. Joan went on an unusual Freedom Ride. She and a group from Washington, which included uh, the, the activist and later SNCC uh, chairman, uh, Stokely Carmichael, flew from Washington to New Orleans, which is where the Freedom Rides were supposed to end. And from New Orleans, they took a train to Jackson and therefore integrated yet another uh, facility, not the bus depot, but the train depot. You stepped off the bus or out of the train and you went into the waiting room and together, and whether it was the black one or the white one, and told to move on and move out. Uh, our Captain Ray, did you all hear me? You're gonna do it? You're under arrest. And out to the paddy wagon, and from there to the city jail, and then you had your trial, so-called, which was also down to absolute routine, and over to the county jail. Okay, it got so crowded in the county jail. Of course, the jails were segregated by gender and race. In the white women's cell, where I was the only Southern, Southerner, locked up with all these Yankees who didn't know what grits and collard greens were, oh, it was bizarre. Um, we were down to less than three square feet of floor space in vision, all you math students. Three square feet of floor space per prisoner. That made sleeping a rather a challenge. People having to sleep underneath the bunks, curled up in the dripping shower, and it got to where they had to do something with us. So they decided, the authorities, um, they would take us up to Partsman Penitentiary, the absolutely most notorious prison in the entire United States. They would take the prisoners on death row and put them someplace else in the prison. And then they would put the Freedom Riders on death row to intimidate us, try to scare us. But I am a Southerner. I knew their game. I was part of that culture, so they didn't frighten me. But they certainly frightened them Yankees. OK, it was roomier. It was cleaner and the food was a whole lot better. But you were, were really cut off from any communication with the world. The lawyer got up once a week and the rabbi came up from Jackson once a week during about a two hour time slot that men of the cloth could visit prisoners. Well, 
I had already been accepted at Tougaloo College, what today we would call an HBCU, Historically Black College or University. We didn't have that term back then. But I had been accepted before the Freedom Rides started, so I figured, hey, the Freedom Rides gave me a free ticket to Mississippi, and the state of Mississippi has given me free room and board for the summer. You know, good deal. So I stayed in jail until it was almost time for school to open. Because we were trying to make it so expensive and inconvenient for the state of Mississippi that they would ind um, allow integration of the travel facilities. Eventually it all worked. But I stayed in right down to the, to the wire to get to go to college. Went to Tougaloo, the only white student there initially. Um, and students were not quite sure about me. Was I just there on my you know, semester abroad vacation type thing? Or was I for real a student? Well, by the time I came back, the second semester and then the second year, I was truly in. And as another student said, and she and I are still friends to this day, she's planning our 55th class reunion. Um, and a few weeks, I was seeing you studying in the library every night, just as hard as the rest of us. I knew you were okay. So. Someone's first night. Oh, my first night. Okay. The word had not gone out all over the dorm that there was a white girl staying there. And back then, they didn't have these suites like they do now in dormitories. Way down the middle of the hall, they had a washroom, toilets, showers, what have you. And everybody went way down the hall to the middle to use them. Well, Mother Nature called me in the middle of the night. And I had on this sort of little flimsy, pale pink um, night garment. And I, they had dimmed the lights in the hallways at night, save electricity. And I was tiptoeing down the hall to the washroom. Well, from the other end of the dormitory, Here's this other girl tiptoeing down the hall. And she sees me and she screams like you wouldn't want to believe. She thought she was seeing a ghost. Well, that sort of startled me and I screamed back. But in the end, Mother Nature won out and we both made it to the washroom and did what we needed to do. And I think by morning, every girl in that dorm knew there was a white girl living there too. So that was my introduction to Tougaloo College, being taken for a ghost. Yeah, well, it's sort of funny, you know, looking back on it, but at the time, oh. Okay, Tougaloo College was ground zero for the civil rights movement in Mississippi. It got no state funding and Virtually all of the funding was from northern churches. So civil rights folks could, everybody coming through Mississippi or in Mississippi working on civil rights came through Mississippi. It was a good place to be. You got to meet everybody. In fact, Dr. King came and spoke in our chapel and then he had to go to a meeting here and lunch there in the president's office, all that type of thing. Well, a few of us were picked to escort him between the buildings. I was one of them. But we still had to be in class if we had class. So we took turns walking Reverend King here and there. And our people said, what was it like to meet Dr. King? Well. I mean, he was this important person, an adult. We went to, and I was a student. So it was polite conversation. Things like, oh, what are you studying? 
What's your favorite subject? How do you like it here? Things like that. Nothing in depth. But it was an honor to be walking Dr. King across campus. And that was my one real-time meeting. I heard him speak a couple times, but that was the only time I met him. Okay, boy, what am I supposed to do next? Okay, 63, thank you. You see, he's my son, I can still call him boy. Yeah. But uh, they were saying he was here with me. Really, I am here with him. He's in charge. He tells me what to do. But I can call him boy, yeah. Um, 63, if most of you all know anything about the Civil Rights Movement in 1963, it is the March on Washington. That was a wonderful day. In the Civil Rights Movement, it was the only good thing in 63. There had been fire hoses turned on to demonstrators in Danville, Virginia. There had been a lot in Birmingham, we'll hear about that, none of it pretty. And there was our lunch counter sit-in in Jackson, Mississippi. Now most of the sit-ins were in 60, but Mississippi was a little, you know, behind the times. Not anymore, but it was back then. And let's see about our sit-in. This new movement would explode on May 28, 1963, when John Salter and Megan Evers took the Jackson boycott to the next level. In all, 14 people would participate in what would become one of the most famous and violent sit-ins of the Civil Rights Movement. I've heard at various times from a reporter, the cameraman, and the son of one of the reporters that this was the most terrifying, frightening event they covered in the Civil Rights Movement. Now, I guess they weren't in Birmingham and Montgomery with the Freedom Riders, but they got around, and uh, this to them was the worst. When the three individuals, uh, Perlina Lewis, Memphis Norman, and Ann Moody, sat down at the white counter, nothing happened. Now, Joan, interestingly, was not supposed to be part of this demonstration. And uh, they said, well, let's go check out what's happening in Woolworth. They had no idea that, that this environment had turned uh, volatile until they walked in the store. And it was right at that moment that a, a, a thug, a former police officer, had come in and pulled Memphis Norman, the one black male, off of his stool knocked him onto the floor and began kicking him mercilessly. Joan was then stuck in the situation wondering what's going to happen next. Um, Anne Moody had been pulled up of her stool and thrown against some of the counters. Um, Perlina Lewis was also pulled from the stool and was down, on, uh, was down on her knees right by the counter when the police officer came on the scene. Both of them rushed back to the counter and so the, so that they were, the demonstration would continue. Joan sees all this and realizes, first of all, she is beginning to communicate with the, the demonstrator. She's, she sees a man with a knife walk by Ann Moody and she calls out, um, Anna, he's got a knife. Um, and all of a sudden she's identified with the people at the counter. Who is this white girl talking to those black girls, you know? So all of a sudden she realizes that she's in danger. But then I sat down. That's when I became a problem. She walked through that mob in the war start. And they realized, of course, immediately where she stood. She joins Perlita and Annie at the counter, the first white to join the demonstration. And at this, the crowd is just incensed. They become like hornets. They start screaming at her. I went immediately to the lunch counter to sit with Joan and Annie Moody. When Salter joined, the crowd turned violent. He was knocked in the back of his head with uh, brass knuckles. Um, there was a student who put his cigarette out on the back of Salter's neck. 
there were several cigarettes, and you can still see it to this day, if you look on the back of the stack, he has scars in the shape of a cigarette. Um, they threw pepper and water mixture into his eyes. Things were just going out of control. And at that point, Joan has said that she believed that they were not going to make it out alive. None of them were going to make it out alive. I can't believe how many times people ask me, did she make it? I'm like, really, she's in the video, guys. I can't tell. So you have to understand this, what was going on in this situation. So my mom, she, she walks into a uh, 400 students here, so it's almost this size of that crowd. This crowd was about, I say, about between two to three hundred people. And she walks in and she sees Memphis getting kicked in the head, right? You know, just beaten up, and blood coming out of every hole in his head, and a few new ones. And she's, she has this opportunity to just walk away. Because they don't know if she's there. No one in the crowd knows, her friends don't know, but she knows. So she goes through this mob, you know, two to three hundred people, and sits down. So they grab, they grab Annie, and they drag him out. And the mom actually gets dragged all the way out of the store, right? Wrestles free, and goes back through the mob again. Is Principal Ray there? Or see, did he depart? Okay. I don't see him here. Darn. Can I borrow you for a moment? Yeah, because you're standing, so it makes it real easy. Come on down. I was going to pick on the principal, but he's not the room at the moment. Yeah, yeah, come on. Come on. Mom, can you come stand right here? In Wisconsin, you can't take me, so that's good. But how tall are you? You're about, you're about my height, so. I'm seven, I mean. Okay, yeah. So, could, could you go through a mob of, could you take on two to three hundred people? No. Okay. Now my mom, if you took away my mom right here, she is, on a good day, she was 5'2", she's now 5'1". She was uh, 105 pounds, soaking wet, is what she says, right? She went through a mob of two to three hundred people. Right. So, I mean, think about that for a moment. Because it's not, it's not, no, it's not, it's not how big you are. It doesn't matter how big you are. Right. It's the size of your heart. It's the courage of your convictions to do what's right, even when it's not easy. You have to believe in something so much that you'll go to the ends of the earth to do it. Right. And I've been asked myself, thank you. I've, I've been asked myself, you know, would you sit down at, at the lunch counter? I said, well, I don't have to, right? Because my mother already did. Um, but I do what I can do. Because doing nothing's not an option. Right. We all have a place. In, in, in this arc of history, to leave our mark and to do our thing, to make America live up to its fullest potential of trying to be a more perfect union, right? And so that's why I do films and those sorts of things. So after this sit-in, uh, two weeks later, Meg Grabbers, who was the field secretary for NAACP, was assassinated in his driveway. Um, Byron Dale I back with. I've actually, I've stood in the driveway with his daughter as she points to where the, you can still see the bloodstains and where she's telling the story of seeing her father and, and crying out, Daddy, get up. Daddy, get up. In August, they had the march on Washington. And it's on August 28th. 1963. And there's a reason why it was on August 28th. Because August 28th, 1955, was when Emmett Till was killed. 
It wasn't by accident. We spent some time in the March on Washington on that day. Rosa Parks said when she was sitting there, she was thinking of them. And many of the people who were involved, these students, like you know, my mother and John Lewis and others, have said they were thinking about him until because they were that part of that generation who grew up knowing that this 14-year-old boy who came down from Chicago was brutally murdered for supposedly whistling out a white Well, after the March on Washington, there was uh, just two weeks later, right? Just over, just over two weeks. A bomb went off at the 16th Street Baptist Church. I'm going to play a video of that. The gentleman at the beginning is a guy named Jerry Mitchell. He's an investigative reporter. Uh, it's funny because my mom, when I first met Jerry, you know, we were at this 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. My mom was like, you know, being a little fangirl. She goes, there's Jerry Mitchell. I'm like, who? So um, I went over and said, hey, Jerry, would you be interested in doing an interview for this film? He says, oh, for Joan? Anything. So I went back and told my mom, and she goes, wow, okay, I didn't know he even knew who I was. Um, but Jerry has brought 20 Klansmen to justice, four of them for murders that they thought they would gotten away with them over 50 years. Just from his work of, you know, getting on the internet and those sort of things, just researching and writing, just not letting it go. Uh, I've heard the voicemail messages that he's received death threats and so forth. Even David Duke had even ordered, you know, his, his death, you know, for someone to go out and kill him. Um, but he continues to persevere and, and to bring these people to justice. But just, just so you know, that's, that's who you're listening to there. It's a, he's got a phenomenal TED talk. I listen to that too. Um, but the kid, people he's going to be showing in particular, at the beginning you see the fire hoses. Those are kids your age and younger. Just couldn't let it go. Had to you know, keep on keeping on. On September 15, 1963, tragedy would befall the most innocent of victims in the battle for racial equality when a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church. We've all seen the footage of people getting sprayed by the water hoses and, and things like that. Well, that was the, pro the protests that were going on at that time, and they were essentially being staged on the 16th Street Baptist Church because it was a downtown church and they could gather there and then leave from there for their protest. And that, so that's what was happening. Well, the Klan didn't like that, so what they did is they planted a bomb underneath the steps on the side of that church and it blew up at about 10.22 in the morning. In fact, the, these, these girls were getting ready for youth service that morning. And in fact, the title of the lesson was called The Love That Forgives. And the mom blew up and killed those four girls. Time for sadness. There was nothing to celebrate. Glass that we picked up out of the gutters at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The day that three of the little girls who had been blown up there were buried. and the police shot over the heads of the people who came out of the church to disperse the mob, right? We attended the funeral. We were staying outside, and uh, we were going to follow the cortege until uh, Ed King and uh, Diane Nash pointed to show us the um, National Guard standing with guns aimed down at us in the streets. The, the National Guard, who had been, been nationalized by the President of the United States, had rebel flags on their uniforms. And I was on this American flag, which was not liked. They just fell in love with the American flag recently in the South. And so the flag was a sign of resistance that I was holding. So you could see them standing all up around with the guns drawn. We were on top of the church. Yeah, all around. I didn't look up at it. And so uh, Ed and Diane said, look, 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 look. The same way they did at Megan's funeral in Jackson when John Doerr came out and started screaming, yelling, said, uh, you must stop because they're going to shoot you, pointing to the guns aimed at people in the streets down Ferris Street. 
It would have been like Charlotte Massacre. I'm not sure they were going to shoot us. I was, we were standing. You're not sure? No. The church, you, you're talking about during the time the film was going on? Yes, ma'am. They had just blown the church up to us. Yeah, but. Martha King was inside. So she was, was killed. The funeral. I was killed. Listen, let me speak, please. <laughs> no. no. There were a lot of people standing in front of the church. And I don't know whether they were going to shoot or not, but if there was any restraint to be had on that day, they would have had it. We bring from these experiences different feelings, impressions, and so on. Well, this is the reality I'm dealing with. Well, so I would have been shot too. Yes, ma'am. And those two sisters. Yes, ma'am. Those two sisters, Tugaloo students, when I was there, <coughs> civil rights leaders on the campus, that's just the way they were back in the day, always picking at each other. So some things never change. Well, the funeral and the death of those kids was bad enough. And then, come November, the President of the United States is assassinated. So when you hear or think about 63 was a good year in civil rights, remember all these other things that happened. Well, then we come to 64. That was the year of Freedom Summer. Now, remember, the sit-in students kept the freedom rides going and then were in Mississippi working on voter registration. Well, they were working on community organizing and realized if you're going to make change, you've got to get people registered to vote so they can elect the people who make and enforce the laws. But it was hard to get registered if you were black in Mississippi. You know, tell me. You, you who told me, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? That's the type of question black folks were asked when they went to register to vote. You never had the right answer. So they thought, if we can get a lot of students from across the country to come to Mississippi and try to get people registered, that we may get somewhere. And hundreds of students came. Three of them never went home. Let's see a little bit about that. In an attempt to stop Freedom Summer and maintain the way of life, the Klan was succeeding in killing three civil rights workers, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwarzer. From the time they were missing, we knew they were dead. And the government had a big search and all this, you know, maybe their life is, but within the movement, we knew they were dead. Just in our gut. In fact, I remember Bob Moses at the Freedom House um, on Rose Street in Jackson, when we were having early discussions about recruiting students in the North to come down about, he was, um, focusing his thoughts on can we ask these students to come down knowing that somebody is going to die. We can tell them they're going to die, but they really won't understand it. But we know they will. Somebody's going to be dead. And the memorial service to James Cheney, Andrew Goodwin, Michael Schwerner, Sunday, August 9, 1964. Well, I wasn't there. But when, when Mickey Schwerner and his wife Rita had first come down to work in Mississippi, um, the winter, the spring before, they were out of Tuvalu. Everybody from the Civil Rights Movement came through Tuvalu. It was the only place you really felt free in Mississippi. And over, I guess, at Ed King's house, he was the chaplain. And so many people were coming through, we sort of took turns. 
giving them the orientation. Fell to me to give Mickey and Rita sort of the orientation of what you really need to know as a white person working in this civil rights in Mississippi. And I think I did a good job. And I know that nothing that I could have added would have made any difference in what happened. But I, I felt not really a responsibility, but a, an unusual connection with that. We'd been by a, a SNCC folks group to Atlanta. We'd stopped at Meridian in their offices for pit stop. And it was really made a place to sleep. So we were closer than average. Then for them to be gone um, could just as easily have been us. But. And actually, beyond that, I was in a car coming back from Canton, deliberately an all-white car. Um, all the passengers were white. Coming back from a mass meeting in Canton, left it before the curfew went into effect. Turns out later through some plan informer um, that we were supposed to have been killed that night to stop the freedom song. And because we weren't killed, our friends were. So thinking about Cheney, Twitter, and Goodman hits home real hard. Now, Cheney was actually from Mississippi. And when they found the bodies buried in this earthen dam at a you know, fish pond, I had heard, I was working at the Smithsonian at the time, and some of the lower echelon black people who knew me there were telling me that over the weekend, after dark, Cheney's body had been brought in in a body bag and examined, and that every bone in his body, virtually, virtually every bone, was broken. He had been beaten that severely. And then the body was taken back out under the cloak of darkness. I don't know who examined him, and it was long enough ago that whoever was involved is no doubt dead. But it was that serious a case. So, Freedom Summer was not stopped. It continued, and people were arrested, shot at, jailed, and some folks got registered to vote. And the SNCC students, who had been the sit-ins, the freedom riders, the community workers in, char in charge of Freedom Summer, they helped things move over to Alabama. And that led to the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is still reenacted every year. Makes national news every year. Now, the state troopers on horseback with whips and nightclubs beat the marchers so severely they could not continue. Congressman John Lewis, I think, still has scars on his head from the beating. An old lady, Amelia Boynton, was knocked unconscious. It was so awful that President Johnson, who was only president because he had been chosen as Kennedy's running mate as a powerful Southern Democrat, because the South wasn't going to vote for that Kennedy boy from up north. Johnson goes on national TV. Back, folks, there were three TV channels back then, three, and they went off the air after the 11 o'clock news.
One like today, the nation came to a standstill when the president was on live. Johnson talked about the meeting. He said, we need a Voting Rights Act. And then to everybody's shock, he said, and we shall overcome. In case anyone missed it, he said again, we shall overcome. We shall overcome, the song was the anthem of the student civil rights movement. We sang it whenever things got rough. Whenever we got afraid, we sang, we shall overcome. That was the death knell of the party that propelled Johnson to the presidency. And he knew it. He knew it was the end of the Southern Democratic Party. I've talked to folks who were working in the White House at the time. He knew exactly what he was doing. To me, that was amazing courage. Well, we got the Voting Rights Act. We got federal registrars. We got more elected black officials in the state of Mississippi than any state in the Union for decades. We got the first elected black governor in the history of the United States. Teachers, who was it? Don't we have any teachers here? Who was the first elected black governor in the history of the United States? In the capital of the Confederacy, which was, it was Doug Wilder in Richmond, Virginia who was elected the first black elected governor. And we got the first elected black president. We got the first black president elected or otherwise in the history of the United States. Barack Obama, who, hello? Barack Obama traced his election back to those four guys sitting at the lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. So when you start something, and I challenge you, I call on you, because you students are the future of our country. Whatever problem you see today, we still have lots of discrimination. My generation took care of legal segregation, but we still have lots of discrimination based on all sorts of things, language, skin color, ethnicity, religion, gender identification, the list goes on. Whatever problem speaks to you, I call on you, I challenge you, to get together with friends who feel the same way, make alliances with groups where you have points of agreement, and now it's your turn to get out there and change the world. And when you start something locally, you never know how far out the ripples are going to go. So get out there and do it. Thank you. students a lot of times talk about the civil rights movement being the ultimate anti-bullying campaign. 
Um, so there's a lot of lessons that can come from that. Yes? So, uh, thanks for you mentioned that you were on a freedom ride with Stokely Carmichael. Can you, can you explain what happened to the movement uh, after 1965 and Stokely Carmichael, head of NCC, took it down a, a more uh, black power violent path? What, what, why did that happen? There were so many white students coming from the North who were not at all familiar with history, Southern culture, all that. They were coming down and trying to tell the black students who were doing all the work how to do it better. And they were just discounting what the students in the South were doing and being superior, knowing how to do it better. But of course, their ideas weren't necessarily going to work in the South. They were geared toward neighbor um, northern labor movements and things like that. And that was resented, them trying to take over things. But Stokely never turned his back on his old friends. From the early movement days, his old white friends, he would go out of his way in public to acknowledge and interact with his old white friends. The other aspect of that is that it was suggested that these whites that were trying to take over and run things go work in their own communities because the real problem was the discrimination coming from the white communities and they should go work on that and let the black kids work on things in the black community because the white, no one likes to be told to get lost. And uh, that is where the real split came. Now, black power originally, and much of it throughout, was not about violence. They sort of gave up on nonviolence, you know, if you hit, hit back. But there was a lot of community organizing, uh, free food programs, school lunch programs, and breakfast programs, daycare centers, medical care free clinics, lots of things that were adopted later by the Great Society started with black power. So, um, and Stokely and I were friends to the end. I, want me to tell that story on you, boy? Okay, we're running out of time. I'll save that one for later. Next question. My problem is I can talk forever. Yes, yes. I would tell them, are you burning that cross? You claiming to be Christian, start acting Christian. Love thy neighbor as thyself and turn the other cheek. It's important to remember as well that, I mean, my mother says that, you don't get a, doing what's right and what's easy are not always the same thing. And so, and you don't get to choose the consequences. You, know, you only get to choose what you're gonna do. Um, you know, she was put on the Klan's most wanted list, hunted down for execution, disowned by her family, you know, attacked and shot at and so forth. But it was still the right thing to do. Um, you know, we're willing to, you know, go, again, go to, go to the ends if that's what it took. But when we see injustice, we need to be willing to stand up and say something about it. When you say nothing, that says everything. Um, what are your thoughts on Malcolm X compared to Martin Luther King's point of views? Well, they started off from different points. But by the end, they had come together. Unfortunately, Malcolm got assassinated before they could really do much together. I 
I think you'd have to ask them what they think. But um, by the end, they were okay with it. In fact, Stokely was speaking at the Smithsonian. I came out, he called me over to speak to him. And he was protected by a semicircle of bodyguards from the nation. So uh, they accepted it. Um, what was your best school memory at being in an all black school? At being in a. Well, it wasn't all black after I got there. <laughs> Graduated, <laughs> isn't that usually our best memory? Graduated, and the good-looking guys, that, that helped. <laughs> but just the lifelong friends I made, like those two crazy sisters, it was good. My mother, folks. <laughs> oh, that's okay, you don't have to hear. Other question? Anybody have a question? The head of prisons in Mississippi was black. They fed us real good when we all went back for the visit. But to see if things were as we remember, to get rid of the bad, you know, any bad vibes we had, frightening thoughts, which, well, I didn't have them, but a lot of folks did. But it was to say, okay, we can. We're stepping totally into, we are stepping into the future by going back in time. And there actually was, there was a debate with the, when we went there, there we weren't certain if we were actually going to be able to go to the prison because they had scheduled an execution for that day. And, uh, and if they were going to, then they had, the problem was going to be they would have all these news cameras there with the freedom riders protesting outside the prison. So, uh, Governor Barber. Governor Barber at the time, he uh, decided to you know, delay that execution so that the Freedom Riders could you know, go back and visit themselves. Um, now, coming back to the Malcolm X question, Nation of Islam question and so forth, um, just, just like with the Black Power, you know, there's these perceptions of, you know, Black Power was about Black empowerment, right? Um, but these things always get twisted by the white media narrative to continue to perpetuate this mythology of, of violence and African Americans are violent people and these sort of things. Um, and it's, we all have to, to do our part to, to really speak truth. Um, when, I, <laughs> when I talk with groups a lot of times, I have a film called Black, White, and Us about you know, transracial adoptions. And at the end of the film, there's a segment where it says, you know, believe me. Do you really believe, because I know every white person here has a black friend, right? Um, how good of a friend are you? Right? We all have a black friend, right? But how good of a friend really are you? Do you really believe what your friend tells you that happens? Or do you brush it off? I don't really think that's what they meant. I don't really think this, I don't think that. Or do you really believe your friends? And if you do believe them, what are you going to do about it? Because right, that's what real friends do. And we stick by our friends. Right? And we try to, if we really believe in equality, if we truly believe in those things, then what are we doing to make sure that everyone enjoys the same rights? Thinking of Muslims has updated a little bit. The standard greeting. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you, 
and to you. Islam is basically, like Christianity, talking about peace. That gets lost. I would say some of these terrorist groups are the equivalent of the Klan. You got them in every religion, every group. And the Crusaders, hey, they were not exactly nonviolent. And they marched, uh, you know, into Islam. Um, so I don't think we can judge lest we be judged. So while most of your work was done between 1960 and 1963, uh, what was your opinion of the, of the national leadership at that time uh, under, the, under John Kennedy and his brother Bobby? What, what were the civil rights uh, workers thinking about? Did they feel that they were doing enough not enough? Not enough. And it wasn't even until mid-63 that Kennedy said we need a civil rights bill. But they would not enforce the Supreme Court rulings on um, integration. We were constantly pushing them. And then we had the matter of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI often working hand in glove with the local police who worked hand in glove with the Klansmen. So it was not a simple situation, but you did see progress in their thinking. And I think Bobby later on became much more um, in tune with reality, shall we say. But then he was assassinated. Um, too much violence in the world. Um, what is like the most inspirational thing anyone's ever said to you or like the best advice you've ever been given, if at all? I think the most inspirational thing is the song, We Shall Overcome, and it went worldwide. I remember listening, it's, it's a statement of faith and hope. And this pebble in the pond thing, to take it a step further. I remember decades ago listening to the radio while I was trying to cook for my five sons. <clears throat> Tried to teach them to cook, apparently there was some success. And on the radio they were talking about their student demonstration in South Korea, and all of a sudden this music comes on that sounds bright and familiar, this singing. I realized they were singing, We Shall Overcome. And just over a year ago, I was in Cape Town, South Africa, singing We Shall Overcome with a group of fifth grade students because that had been the song of their anti-apartheid demonstrations. So to me, that is the most inspirational thing, is that song. Were there any times where you thought about giving up? No. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Anybody? Okay, over here. after the 1950s. Right now I'm talking to y'all, that's continuing my work. When I was working in the um, schools in my career, I was fitting in a little bit about um, the civil rights movement, every good chance I got, not just in February. At my kids' school, I did things, in fact, when he was in fourth grade, his music teacher asked me for a, a good song to, to teach the student the course um, that related to black history. And I said, my mind is going blank on the title, lift every voice and sing. My brain cells get a little old and tired sometimes. 
lift every voice and sing the Negro National Anthem. She, not, she didn't know the song. Not only did she teach it to the chorus, she taught it to every kid in his elementary school, probably the first historically white school in the state of Virginia for the students to sing that song. And they sang it all at a big international dinner. Okay, let's, let's give Joan and her son a big round of applause.